a previous episode, I looked at the two museums that face each other in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park, the de Young Museum and the California Academy of Sciences. In the present episode, I look at the evolution of Golden Gate Park itself. I've come to realize that the creation of Golden Gate Park has been the creation of one of San Francisco's most important museums. Most histories of Golden Gate Park point to two men as its original designers. William Hammond Hall, who commenced his work in the 1870s and was succeeded by his assistant, John McLaren, in the late 1880s. Building the park was a moral mission for them. The park had to be defended in its infancy against the encroachment of building amusements. These men were creating a bucolic park for leisure, relaxation, and the enjoyment of being among woods, lakes, and meadows pleasures that would otherwise have been spoiled if the park were also full of buildings and amusement rides. As Hall noted, destroy a public building and it can be rebuilt in a year. Destroy a woodland park and all the people living at the time will have passed away before its restoration can be effected. McLaren became famous for densely planting out proliferating park statuary so that such man-made elements would disappear enabling a pure natural landscape. Their conception of the park brought them into conflict with some of the most powerful and wealthy men in San Francisco. In 1876, after James Lick died, 27 people, including the railroad baron Stanford and Crocker, paid to dismantle Lick's large wood and glass greenhouse at his South Bay estate and relocate it within Golden Gate Park. This was not a part of Hall's original design. Nevertheless, he ended up placing it at the easternmost end of the park, at the Plateau Mound, near the roads that brought San Franciscans out to the park. The Conservatory of Flowers opened in 1881, along with the park's first bandstand. One can read the successive locations of this bandstand as a kind of line in the sand beyond which Hall and later McLaren did not want large-scale buildings to be built. By 1888, the bandstand stall, now funded by the Spreckles family, was moved a quarter mile southeast and placed in a wide plaza that surrounded a statue of Francis Scott Key, commissioned by Lick to celebrate the composer of the United States National Anthem. This wide plaza was now the center for the wealthy to parade in their large horse-drawn carriages, showing off their latest fashions to the oogling citizens who looked on from the nearby hillside called Favorite Point or Chicken Point. The designers of the Brooklyn Bridge were hired to build a steel suspension bridge overlooking this roundabout so that carriages and citizens might not mix. By 1900, the carriage roundabout had become tennis courts for the upper class. Versions of these courts remain to this day. The statue, however, moved subsequently to the concourse. As early as the 1870s, all the railroad barons, Stanford, Hopkins, Huntington, and Crocker, pressed to construct a large horse racetrack in the park. Hall at first suggested obscure, out-of-the-way sites for high-speed horse racing, but to no avail. And by the late 1880s, Hall and then McLaren ended up having to cut a wide, straight, mile-long horse raceway through the center third of the park. It was called the Speed Road. Its construction was initiated by funding provided by the Railroad Four and their friends. The Speed Road was completed in 1895 in time for the Midwinter Exposition. Large building amusements for the growing city of San Francisco did not start at the park. The early ones were adjacent to the population centers in the eastern half of the city. Robert Woodward, in 1861, purchased the large grounds and home of departing General Fremont that was located between the Mission District and the enlarging Buena Vista Cove area that was moving up through the south of Market District towards the Mission. Woodward had made his money a decade earlier providing housing and eating facilities for the incoming Gold Rush men. And soon his newly purchased home was filling up with artifacts, plants, and animals collected during his European travels. He added lakes, fountains, and gardens to his property 
and by 1865 had begun charging the public a fee to enter his now six acres worth of grounds. Woodward Gardens soon had stuffed animals, the first public aquarium in the western United States, statuary, fine art, restaurants, pipe organ concerts, a roller rink, and spectacles. Woodward built a line of horse-drawn rail cars to bring patrons from the downtown up a wooden plank Mission Street to his gardens, now known as Central Park of the West. The garden stayed open until 1891, and after the 1906 earthquake, the San Francisco Armory and the main factory of Levi Strauss were erected where the garden had once been. Woodward Garden had disappeared totally into the fabric of newly graded and subdivided city blocks and lots. As Golden Gate Park required constant watering, Hall, a brilliant engineer, arranged to supply the park with water by the Spring Valley Water Company. By 1890, Strawberry Hill, a large existing hill in the middle of Golden Gate Park, was being graded around its base, making a new man-made lake, Stow Lake. The park water was now being pumped from underground wells such as those at the windmills. Water from the wells near Strawberry Hill would be pumped to the top of the hill and cascade down a newly constructed waterfall, and in turn it would flow into Stow Lake, and from Stow, the water passed into irrigation systems into the adjoining park areas. Two years after Woodward Garden closed, McLaren faced the biggest challenge to his woodland conception of Golden Gate Park, the Midwinter Exposition. Michael DeYoung, the rather roguish founder of the San Francisco Chronicle, was California's representative to the 1893 Chicago Columbia World Exposition. DeYoung was enthralled by the Chicago Fair and its impact on its reputation and economy. DeYoung raised private funds totaling around 300000 and persuaded the state to allow the construction of the 1894 Midwinter Exposition in Golden Gate Park. When the exposition opened in January of 1894, DeYoung was one of the major landowners of large land tracts in what would become the neighborhoods immediately adjoining the park. During wintertime, when the bulk of the U.S. population back east was freezing and under snow, San Francisco and California would be seen as a year-round resort. I can only imagine the horror that the midwinter exposition posed to McLaren. Large portions of the eastern one-third of the park were leveled. Trees were cut down, and a large network of railroad tracks was built into the park to accommodate the thousands of workers and materials converging to build its more than 100 buildings and grounds in a little more than six months' time. In de Young's hands, the center of the midwinter exposition was the concourse, a large garden depressed below the adjacent grades the outlines of which remain to this day. In the center of the concourse rose a tall tower modeled roughly after the Eiffel Tower, atop of which was set a large electrically powered searchlight. The photograph here shows the beacon focused on a spot at the top of Strawberry Hill. Large exhibition halls surrounded the concourse. There were halls for horticulture, mining, industry, arts, and research and education. And here, off to the side, was a relatively small Egyptian-themed fine arts building. Rather than being a coherent, integrated setting of grand buildings, the exposition was more like a corralling of disparate structures that simply clustered around the concourse and its beacon. The exhibition was a success, with over 1.3 million visitors during its five-month tenure. As author Christopher Pollock has written, the exposition's entertainments included a 100-foot diameter Ferris wheel called the Firth, the grotesque Dante's Inferno, where fairgoers could experience the torments of hell after entering through the gaping mouth of a huge dragon, and a replica of Hawaii's Kilauea volcano within a cyclorama. During and immediately after the midwinter exposition, the largely vacant lands adjoining Golden Gate Park became the sites for new, private, large building amusements. In 1895, the Chutes opened as a water amusement park in the middle of what would later become the Haight-Ashbury District, nestled at the southeastern end of the park. 
Seven years later, the chutes moved to a larger facility along the north edge of the park near the concourse. In 1895, Adolf Sutro took over the ownership of the Cliff House immediately north of Golden Gate Park at the Pacific Ocean and built this version of the Cliff House Resort. A year later, he opened the iconic Sutro Baths immediately next door. The agreements between McLaren and de Young called for the exposition to be dismantled and returned to parkland upon the closing of the exposition. Yet some buildings were kept. The recessed concourse with its asymmetric pathway system was reworked into a new formal axial set of civic spaces complete with fountains. The bandstand was relocated to its current location at the western end of this concourse. It was called the Spreckles Temple of Music and provided with a large tree-shaded seating area within the concourse. The small Egyptian-flavored fine arts building at the northeast end of the concourse was saved and turned into San Francisco's first public art museum. McLaren's post-exposition conversion of the western end of the midwinter fairgrounds into a major landscape-only arboretum proved a very hard sell. Formal funding took three decades to secure. In the meantime, the city built another massive building amusement after the 1906 earthquake, the 1915 Pan Pacific Exposition. It was not until 1926 that Helene Steibring donated the funds necessary to ensure the completion of the Arboretum. I can only imagine what McLaren thought about this early and abandoned plan for the Pan Pacific Exposition that called for the entire bucolic western half of Golden Gate Park to be raised and built out with major buildings. The 1906 earthquake brought housing into the park with wood cabins temporarily housing thousands of people such as those at the concourse and in the speed road. Within a decade after the earthquake, the upper classes were in the midst of building major summer and country estates down the peninsula in the East Bay and up in Marin County. Horse and other elite amusements could now occur in the comfort and seclusion of spacious grounds and country clubs. The pressure to house upper class events within Golden Gate Park subsided. Yet the need to monetize and memorialize the elite's artifact collections remained a potent force for park building efforts. Several new museums took place around the concourse. The Little Fine Arts Museum grew into the de Young Museum. De Young underwrote its admission fees so they were free to the public. Like Robert Woodward before him, Michael de Young needed a public place to house his burgeoning collections bought during his world travels. His Pacific Heights mansion was getting crowded. In 1916, de Young donated a new building adjacent to the Fine Arts Building, and it was named the H.M. de Young Museum. He would spend time in his museum browsing and talking to visitors. After his death in 1925, the museum continued to expand. The de Young website notes, de Young's taste for the curious, intricate, and ornamental was reflected by the acquisition of painting and sculpture, arms and armor, fine porcelain, objects from the South Pacific and American Indian cultures, including original art objects as well as reproductions. 6,000 persons viewing the exhibits on a Sunday was considered not at all out of the ordinary. The California Academy of Sciences was funded in 1853, the oldest scientific institution west of the Mississippi. William Hammond Hall was inducted into the Academy in the 1880s, and by 1891 it had its own wonderful high-rise museum and facilities on Market Street, near where the Bloomingdale Nordstrom Westfield Mall is now located. Funded by James Lick, the Academy's Market Street facility featured rent-producing commercial offices facing Market and a large museum complex at the rear. The 1906 earthquake destroyed this facility. The academy was rebuilt on the concourse opposite the Fine Arts Building. In 1923, the Steinhardt Aquarium was constructed behind the first academy structures. In 1930 came the African Hall and the offices, creating an ever-enlarging academy that now had an interior central courtyard on axis with its aquarium entry. Later came the Morrison Planetarium, 
A whale sculpture from the 1939 Treasure Island World's Fair was placed in the center courtyard. At the beginning of this episode, I suggested that Golden Gate Park itself is one of San Francisco's most important museums. From a treasure house point of view, you could say that it houses attractions such as the de Young, the Academy of Sciences, the Conservatory of Flowers. But do these make it the seminal San Francisco museum? What about its meadows and lakes? What's so special about those? Wouldn't they be found throughout San Francisco if it weren't built up? Well, the answer is no. Remember, Golden Gate Park has to be artificially watered. It cannot sustain itself otherwise. Its woodland setting is not what was here before San Francisco grew up. In fact, Golden Gate Park itself is as man-made as the city of San Francisco. Hall and McLaren would have held that their newly created park was a natural environment, more so than the sand dunes that had actually been there before. It would have seemed absurd for them to consider that the sand dunes and bare mountainscapes of the original San Francisco could be the natural origins of such a great city. So knowingly or not, they created a better fantasy for what the original landscape of the San Francisco of tall and dense buildings and bridges must have been. Golden Gate Park is no less than a rare, precious, cultivated artifact. It is a treasure house of cared for, artificially created environments that create and help sustain a myth about what San Francisco might have been had it not been urbanized. The park allows its citizens to forget or remain ignorant of the fact that San Francisco of today is based upon an eradication of its original landscape an eradication that occurred largely within the first 40 years of its 160-year history. Like a good museum, its underlying role is to rewrite history. In this case, Golden Gate Park rewrites the history of San Francisco itself. This is why I'm suggesting that it is one of San Francisco's most important museums. In the next episode of Here, we look at the San Francisco houses of architect Bernard Maybeck, designed just after the 1906 earthquake, but before the construction of the 1916 version of the de Young Museum. <laughs>